Uh, glad, glad that you're here this evening. Um, as far as announcements go, if you'll check check your bulletin, you'll kind of you'll kind of see what's going on there. Uh, we'll have a back to school uh, family night. That's going to be next Sunday at five o'clock. Um, always need uh, hands, so if you'd like to uh, help in some way, please uh, let Mandy know that you're willing to uh, to lend a hand and help out. And uh, so that's our back to school bash uh, at uh, five o'clock next Sunday evening. Um, and we're doing. Um, I'm kind of excited about this. This is this is kind of neat. Uh, we're gonna do um, a prayer. Okay, hold on. Let me let me let my brain wake up from a nap here. Hold on a minute. Um, we're going to uh, do. We're going to be praying over the children's backpacks. So um, and, uh, as they come. Uh, They'll bring their backpacks. They're going to place their backpacks down. And uh, we're going to have a special uh, prayer time over all, over all of the children's backpacks and so forth. And um, this is kind of, a diff- kind of a different way to pray for all of our kids and uh, remind them that they're going to be prayed for during the school year. And, um, and so that's good. And then we're also going to be uh, giving away a backpack full of school supplies. So uh, and some other thing And some other things. So we're just going to have a big old... A big old good old fun time together, and that's going to be uh, back to school next Sunday night at five o'clock. All right, um, and then you have all the information about the the upcoming uh, events. If you would like to to help with revival, well, there's plenty of ways and plenty of places to help. Uh, there's some sign up sheets there out in the foyer, and uh, if you'd like to. You know, help with any of the meals. If you'd like to help with uh, pre- being on a prayer team, a uh, greeter, um, um, and those types of things. So please uh, sign up. Uh, we already have some folks out there that signed up, and um, and I'll contact you about about any specifics. Um, it what it's not in the bulletin, but uh, Brotherhood is going to meet. Uh, August the 8th, and so they'll have their uh, 6 o'clock meeting on August the 8th. Uh, any any other announcements you want to mention? We'll have a short business meeting uh, right after church tonight to vote on our nominating committee. Prayer request. Anyone that uh, you'd like to add to our, our prayer list? I know um, Miss Mary Nettles, uh, she has uh, COVID, <clears throat> and uh, her husband, Mike, he, he just had knee replacement last week. Um, so. Yeah. She did, she, yeah. She she got to come back home, and uh, my wife Christy, uh, she she's um, got COVID as well. So so she's she's uh, been sick since Thursday of last week. So um, I'd like to pray for her too. It's good to see Judy. How's Glenn? Good. Very good. Praise the Lord. And so, Abby. And uh, my stepfather, Billy Ray, he's dealing with a fracture in his back uh, and COVID. So, he's, uh, he's hanging in there. Um. Not everybody I know got COVID now, seems like. Um, Elliot Smith, uh, Joanne's Elliot, uh, his daughter passed away uh, today real suddenly. Um, I don't know her name. I hear Lacey Lee. last name okay 
they're still waiting on um, uh, Gary's uh, services. They, his sister, uh, they had uh, they had COVID too. So when we got home from the youth trip, I had contacted her and uh, her and her husband both had COVID. So um, I was kind of delaying the the memorial service there. Um, Anyone else? All right. Well, Miss Denise, if you'll come and open us up in our call to worship. If you will stand with me and turn to 549. Higher ground. We sing the first and the last. 549. We also needed to, to mention on our prayer list uh, Mr. Ellis, uh, Gerald Smith's family. Uh, that's uh, Matthew Smith's uh, father that passed away, and um, and so we need to uh, to remember remember them. They had the funeral services uh, yesterday, and uh, so let's pray for them. All right, if you would um, pick somebody to pray for, and maybe they maybe this. Maybe it's someone that you know needs to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Maybe it's a particular issue that, that they're going through. But uh, but pick somebody to pray for tonight, and, and let's pray for them. And then I'm going to pray for the, the prayer list, okay? Lord, we thank you for all your blessings in our lives and, and Lord, for just the way that you're at work, Lord, um, individually, uh, as families and as our church family. And Lord, tonight we pray um, not only for those that, that have been on our prayer list for some time, going through different illnesses and dealing with different things, but Lord, we pray tonight for those that we have mentioned especially and we lift up Miss Mary Nettles and and I would pray for her healing, Lord. We pray that you'd protect uh, Mike as he's recovering from surgery and uh, that you'd watch over him. I pray, Lord, that you would be with Christy and, and just help her, God, to, to get well and regain her strength. And we lift up Abby and pray, Lord, for her healing also. 
Lord, we pray especially uh, for the Smith family tonight as, as they're hurting and, and grieving and, and Lord, just, uh, just having to deal with, um, with the loss, Lord, uh, and, and the sudden loss. And uh, Lord, I just pray that, that you would comfort them, that you would remind them of, of who you are and how strong you are. And just let your peace and your presence, God, to be with them in a special way. Uh, Lord, we do pray for um, Mr. Elliot Smith's family and the loss of his daughter. And we pray, God, for, for your comforting presence uh, for them as well, and that you would lift them up and, and be with them, Lord. So, Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, uh, speak to our hearts this evening and, and help us, God, to receive your word and, and to let your word, Lord, uh, transform our lives in, in, in all the ways, God, that makes us more like Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for our offertory hymn, if you'll turn to 526, the solid rock. We'll sing the first and the fourth. Let's uh, look at a couple passages by the Apostle John this evening. So look with me in John 13, we're going to look at 34 and 35, and then look at 1 John chapter 3. So, so John 13, 34 and 35, and 1 John um, chapter 3. Apparently, uh, I think I might have left my uh, preaching Bible at camp. So anybody run back up there for me and get it right quick? So uh, <laughs> I, I cannot, I can't, it's not in my backpack, it's not, um, I, I can't find it, so I, I, I might have uh, left it there in the chapel, kind of in the excitement of the, <laughs> of the last night. So, um, so anyway, I thought that's, that's uh, something. I don't know, me and my Bibles lately haven't been, uh, I got off the kids camp in a rush and, and didn't even take a Bible to kids camp. So I had to hear about that from Mandy, the whole kids camp. I forgot my Bible. 
And then I finally take my Bible to youth camp, and I guess it's still up there. So, um, so they do what? Just wait. <laughs> so, uh, take take just a moment. You you may or may not uh, have one of these little things, but if you'll look at your shirt or at your shoes, uh, you you might see an emblem or a symbol. It might be a swish, or it might be some uh, some little lines. Um, you might have one of those little alligators, or you might have uh, one of those little men on a horse uh, on, on your on your shirt as well. When you think about our culture, our culture is filled with iconic symbols. So uh, I'll name the symbol, and you name uh, the company. It's the Golden Arches. We spent a lot of time there, don't we? Uh, the little apple with the bite out of it. Apple on the pewter, that's right. And you know, companies uh, over the past few decades have really moved toward creating a brand, almost more than, than making products. And because these brands, these symbols, are easily recognizable, they are very distinct, and, um, and companies want to connect with customers. Uh, and they want to be able to extend their, hello? And they want to be able to extend their products, whether it's AT&T or, um, or whatever that it might be. They want to be able to extend uh, their products, new products, to other people. Um, I know I was talking to my cousin uh, Blake, and Blake uh, happens to be kind of the entrepreneur of our family. He, he owns his own um, business. He's a contractor in Baton Rouge. Um, he builds neighborhoods and so forth. And um, He's kind of like the Donald Trump of, of the family, so to speak. And uh, we were talking uh, here a year or so ago, and, and he was telling me about his new, new uh, endeavor, and his new endeavor was building him a brand. And uh, he, his name's uh, Joseph Blake Sagan, and so he's going to build his brand, JBS, Just Built Strong. And on top of all of that, he's kind of one of these big bodybuilder guys, you know, and uh, he likes his whole concept of uh, being big and strong. And so he wanted to market his brand, and, and he was going after it. He was, you know, not, building, not making a product. He just wanted a brand. And uh, he can get all these products and put his just-built-strong brand on it and sell his brand. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out, well, ha, ha, well okay. Well, our last uh, family meeting, 4th of July, my brother Andy's sitting there with a just built strong hat on so uh, it's already working but what about the brand of you what about you what is distinct about you what kind of feelings do people have when they are around you when they spend time with you um what do people think what does your attitudes and your actions communicate uh, to other people? You see, long before uh, Starbucks and Izod and Polo and Apple and Nike and McDonald's, long before they came along with their brands, Jesus understood the need for his followers to be distinctively different, for his disciples to have a brand of their own and that it was very Definitive, a very distinct identity. And when you look in John 13, verse 34 through 35, you really see that brand very clearly. And, you know, we, we could talk about a, a lot of different things about, about church, about uh, religion. We can talk all kind of different things. But if we miss this, we really miss what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. A new commandment. Okay? So Jesus is saying, here's the new standard. He's already talked about the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But he's saying this. He's saying, hey, this new commandment is that you're going to follow me. You're going to follow my pattern, my example in the way you fulfill 
God's word, the way you fulfill your ethics and your morality in relation to other people. I am the standard. I am the example. You're my followers. Verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, by Christ-like love, that's your identity. By Christ-like love, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus is saying this Christ-like love is what sets a Christian apart. This Christ-like love is, is what makes you distinct as a believer. And without Christ-like love, nothing else in your Christian life rings true. It really doesn't. You can have a perfect Sunday school attendance. You can give boo coodles of money to, to the church or to charity. You can even give your life for the cause of Christ. But without Christ like love, none of that really matters. Now, how could I say that? Well, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul said, I can have faith that moves mountains. I can, I can die a martyr. You know, I can do all of these things in the name of Christ. But if, if it's not in love, it's nothing. And I am nothing. So I think that is a distinctive identity of a believer that, that we cannot miss and we cannot overlook and we must strive to be better at loving one another and applying what that looks like in our relationships. You know, Christians, if you think about what Jesus is saying, Christians are not known to the world because they dress alike or because they vote alike or because they attend the same church or because the church has all these different programs, ministries, and missions Jesus is saying we should be known by our love. In other words, when you walk up to somebody in Lincoln County and you tell them that you go to Friendship Baptist Church, the first thing they should think of is, wow, them folks love each other down there. Man, you go to friendship and, and people are going to love you. And Jesus is saying, that's the distinguishing mark. That's the brand. So, so what is the kind of love that we're talking about? It, it's the agape love, the, the love of the scriptures, the love of God. And, and when you think about it, that kind of love, the, the whole motivation of God's love, of Christ-like love, is the good of the other person. What's in that person's best interest? And so our attitudes and our actions then are aimed at and are, are targeted toward what's good for the other person. What's in their best interest? Now, when that's your idea of love, when we're understanding that, that love is not about our feelings, uh, you, love is not about what we like, love is not about what makes us comfortable, love, love is not about how other people make us feel. When our love is Christ-like love, it is aimed at the good of the other person. Therefore, you, you can love your enemy. You can love people that don't like you. You can love people that treat you like a dog. And you're called to love them because love is aimed at the best interest of another person. It's not about your feelings. And, and so that's the way God calls us to love. Now look with me in 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, John puts it like this way, and John speaks with, with a lot of experience here. 
And I've mentioned this to you before, but I'll remind you of it again. John was known as a son of thunder. John was a very hot-tempered man. And, and he was a very, um, he, he was a gentleman that was high-strung, so to speak. And in one occasion when, when uh, Jesus and, and the disciples were passing through a particular uh, Sumerian area, and this village refused to accept Jesus, John was one that spoke up and said, Lord, let's call down fire from heaven and burn them up. So he, he wasn't necessarily known for his love when he followed Jesus. But the way he experienced Jesus, the way he watched Jesus, and the way Jesus loved him, it transformed his heart. That He became the apostle of love. And in his writings in the New Testament, he talks about love more than any other New Testament author. And look what he says here in 1 John 3. He says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. Jesus is our example, right? John saw this clearly. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. Does that mean that you should step in front of a bullet? That you should take a bullet for somebody? Well, in some cases, yes. Now, I mean, that obviously doesn't happen very often. But look what it says in verse 17, and you really get to what John is talking about. He's not necessarily talking about those extreme moments where, where somebody must physically give their life for someone else. He's talking about the daily obligations of us as believers. And he says, but whoever, verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart, closes his heart from him, turns his back on him, how does the love of God abide in him? So if you see the needs of, of, of another person and you just shut your heart off to them, John says I, he doesn't understand how God can live in you. Well, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in what? In deeds and in truth, in action and in truth. And that's really the grounds of the love of God. It's not just about what we say. It's, it's not a good talk. The love of God, where God lives in you and God is motivating your attitude and your actions, that love is aimed at the good of someone else. It is aimed at meeting their needs. It is aimed at building them up. And John says here that that's the daily obligation of a Christian, that we're called to a Christ-like love. And that's a great challenge, isn't it? And when we talk about growing in Christ, and when we talk about being followers of Jesus and, and growing in Christ, that has to be a foremost goal of ours is to love people better, to be a more loving church, to be a more loving person, to learn how to love people. And, and that requires denying ourselves, doesn't it? You know where it says here, Jesus said, uh, it says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. You know, God may never ask you to physically lay your life down for somebody else. But what about laying down some selfish attitudes? What about laying down some of our own stuff, whether it's resentments or anger? What about the little ways that we need to deny ourselves so that we can show God's love to other people, to someone else? There's all kind of ways that we need to 
We need to die to our pride or die to, die to our anger or die to our frustrations or die to our selfishness, whatever that it might be, so that we can better love other people. So that Christ-like love can be the brand of our lives. And so when folks think about you, whether it's on your ball team or whether it's at your workplace or, or whatever that it is, they think, man, he really loves people. Or man, she really loves people. And we can't always expect the, the world to know that or to understand it because, you know, the world's not going to get the Christian, so to speak. But the world will know there's something different about you and how you relate to people when Christ-like love is your brand. So let's close with this story I want you to hear. There was a missionary in China who was translating the New Testament into the Chinese language. Now, he was being assisted by a great Chinese scholar who was a Confucianist who had never been exposed uh, to Christianity. Week after week and month after month, they sat side by side working through the biblical text of the New Testament. When the project was nearly completed, the missionary told his friend, you have helped, you have been a great help to me. I could have never gotten along without you. Now I want to ask you a question. Uh, as we have gone together through the New Testament, hasn't the beauty of Christianity touched you? Wouldn't you like to become a Christian? The Confucianist replied, Yes, Christianity does appeal to me. I think it presents the most wonderful system of ethics I have ever known. I believe that if I ever saw a Christian, I might become more interested in becoming one myself. But, the missionary said, I am a Christian. You? You are a Christian? I hope you will not take offense, but I must tell you that I have observed you and listened to you from the beginning. If I understand the New Testament, a Christian is one who follows Jesus. And Jesus said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You cannot be a Christian, for I have listened to you as you have talked about others in an unkind way. I have observed, too, that whereas your New Testament says that God will supply all your needs, you do not trust him. You worry about this and about that. And if your check is a day late, you become dreadfully concerned. Now, you cannot be a Christian. But I think that if I ever see one, I should be like one. Convicted to the core, the missionary broke down. And with a repenting heart, he confessed his attitude and his actions. And he asked God for forgiveness. He also asked for the scholar's forgiveness as well. Through the brokenness of this man, the Confucianist later remarked, Well, perhaps I have seen a Christian after all. What do we need to repent of? What do we need to confess? What do we need to be forgiven of so that we can be that distinct follower of Christ? So that his love can be the brand uh, of our lives. Easily recognizable when people come in contact with us and see us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you today. And Lord, I pray that you would um, speak to our hearts, Lord. And Lord, we're all in a growing process. All of us at different levels, Lord, uh, as Christians. But, Lord, there's things in, in our lives, Lord, that you want to remove so that we can become more like you. Lord, I pray that we would hear you speak into our lives, Lord, that we would repent, Lord, that we would receive your word, 
and we would allow you to renew us, revive us, and grow us, Lord, to be more like you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with me as we have our...